The Patia City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. I've got a little story that has to do with pain management. I was recently up at Bangkok Hospital Patia and I, I had to stay overnight. When I woke up the next morning, the doctor was at the foot of my bed and he was scribbling on his little uh, sheet there and I, I looked at him, I said, doctor, is, I may, not, may be making a mistake, but I think you're trying to write out my, my chart with a rectal thermometer. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, some asshole's got my pencil. I'm sorry, that's bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce Doc Martin, and uh, he's going to inform you about pain management, so if you're in any kind of pain, he's going to help you out today. He left his business card on the table, so you have a contact there. So, Dr. Martin, welcome, and make sure you have your phones turned off. thermometer or an oral thermometer what's the difference the taste sorry about that I didn't like it either all right um, here we go so as you know this is you've seen this before this is me um, I work out of Sparta the, the um, uh, club, med club medical patai works out of uh, a spa Um, is this working? Oh yeah, it's perfect. Okay, that's the new card. Right, 7am, 7 7 7 1977 It's the beginning of my career in pain management. So what happened? To, um, uh, to give a bit of context to the situation, in early 1975, Without a rectal examination, our local doctor diagnosed my father's rectal bleeding as piles. Good decision, doctor. What, is it, what, is it, what did David say? Um, uh, any physician who diagnoses piles without a rectal examination takes on a grave responsibility. Okay, because the bleeding persisted, my dad returned six months later when he was seen by another doctor. He was immediately admitted to hospital for excision of his colon colonic cancer. Despite wide resection and chemotherapy, over the next two years, my father succumbed to this aggressive cancer. The tumor metastasized to his posterior abdominal wall and many other places where it destroyed all the tissues in its path. He suffered terrible pain as the cancer consumed him from within. Uh, in the last three weeks of his life, our father slipped into a coma. With the assistance of a 24-hour nursing care, he remained at home. I returned home from medical school on the 6th of July, 1977. The nurse was exhausted. I released her and assumed my dad's pain management. I'm not sure. Okay, this, is, this isn't my dad. This is just a picture to, to, to give you uh, an idea of what was happening. This is the bedroom, and we had a a table here with all the drugs on and I would uh, manage him through the night which is what I did. So every four hours <coughs> um, to keep him comfortable he required four hourly injections of morphine and Largactyl. Throughout the night each time throughout the night each time as I prepared the treatment I told him that I was about to inject him. I explained that Largactyl is a painful injection which it is and I apologized for the discomfort. But it, would, uh, but it would settle his pain. Naturally, there was no response because he'd been in a coma for three weeks. He required three further injections through the night. Each time I apologized to him. Around 7 a.m. the following morning, um, 
once again he showed signs of agitation uh, and uh, he was due another injection I had my back turned to him and as I prepared the, prepared the treatment once again I apologized for the pain that Largactyl may cause him and which he said that's all right son and I span round because he was in a coma I span round and what I saw was his face change it, all the all the pain and um, noxious experience he'd had for two years was just gone and then I saw this energy go at the top of his head he died so any idea what happened there no so it's well known um, that people about, about to die um, get a sort of hyper reality they can they come back from near death and the la just and just before they die they get tremendous clarity and can talk normally and that's what my dad did he thanked me for looking after him and then he died so what was this thing that went out of his head any idea spirit any any other ideas sorry no you well I wouldn't see it or f I'm not sure if I saw it or felt it to be quite honest I think I saw it yeah, it's the spirit. So there's three things, body, soul, and spirit. All right? The Holy Trinity. God the Father is the body. God the Son is our soul. And God the Spirit is our spirit, which is what, my, which is what left my dad. So does the spirit die or leave the body as soon as the body dies? Any idea? No? Well, it can, it can stay there for quite a long time. If you listen to ties, it can be like up to two weeks, in fact, even more. And um, it's really a weird experience when you see a dead body with a spirit inside it. It's like the, the, the patient who's dead could just wake up and talk to you. I've talked to pathologists about this, and they find it really eerie when they're having to, when they're having to open up somebody's chest and brain, and they're dead, but their spirit's still there. So in Thai, it's, uh, it's well recognized. In Thailand, it's well recognized that, uh, that uh, this phenomenon happens. And you know when you go to a cremation, you know those really loud bangs and things that they have before they incinerate the body? You know what I'm talking about? You know, the really loud bangs. That's to wake up the spirit, to tell it to leave before the body's cremated. So it's a real thing. Okay. Um, and if you want to look at this another way, this is the uh, Taoist point of view. Um, so this is uh, how they see the light, the universal key, goes into organic systems, processing, and then death, the universal key or energy, goes back to the universal key, and it, and it goes round and round like that. This is, um, this is inert objects here. Okay. All right. So, estimates suggest that glo oh, sorry, we'll get on to pain management now. <laughs> estimates suggest that globally 20% of adults suffering from pain, 20% of a uh, adults suffer from pain, and that each year 10% are newly diagnosed with chronic pain. Chronic pain is now considered to be disease in its own right, chronic pain syndrome. Uh, initially proposed in 2004 based on evidence of nervous system changes in people with chronic pain. Brain imaging studies suggested structural and functional changes in the brain that were reversible with appropriate therapy. Many of these changes were associated with the limbic system. The limbic system is here. The limbic system sits in there. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, okay. So during the International Pain Summit of 2011, it was determined that pain should no longer be just a symptom. It should be considered to be a clinical entity in its own right. An appropriate treatment should, be, uh, should, be brought, uh, should bring real improvement to the patient's well-being. And in 2011, a declaration of Montreal, Montreal said that um, pain management states that people facing pain have the right to appropriate pain management. 
I think Thailand missed that memorandum. Okay, so we've got two sorts of pain. Well, three, because we have psychological pain as well. Um, so we have somatic pain versus visceral pain. Somatic pain. Okay. Um, somatic pain system developed approximately 85 million years ago when primates diverged from other mam um, mammals. Um, you okay? You okay? Okay. Um, so somatic is exterior pain and it's predictable in its distribution. The pain is felt and transmitted to the brain by the nerves that supply the dermatomes. These are dermatomes here. These are the nerves coming out of the spinal cord. Uh, a dermatome is an area of skin supplied by a specific spinal nerve. The brain appreciates this pain in a reliable and predictable manner, where, whether it uh, arises from the skin or from the nerve itself. For example, a lumbar disc protrusion on the left side that compresses the L5 nerve root will be experienced as pain down the ipsilateral leg into the hallux or big toe. So this is uh, what this is L5 here. See, yeah. Okay. Um. So I, I want you to notice because it becomes relevant in a minute. C4 and C6. C4 is up here. Uses a sens sensation here, and C6 is. C6 is here, thumb. Okay. Um. There we go. So this is a uh, pain pathway. Okay? It's quite simple. So you sort of hurt your toe, all right? And then there's a nerve which goes up into the spinal cord here, where it's, where it, There, where it synapses, oh God. where it synapses, here, and then it goes it, it goes over to the other side of the spinal cord and then shoots up the spine to the thalamus. This is called the spinothalamic tract, where it where it where it synapses again with the receptors in the outside of our brain, and that's how we appreciate pain. Um, so, any idea of this you see here? There's slow demyelinated C fibers and fast myelinated A fibers. Any idea why there's two different fibers to receive the same pain? Doctor? Reflex. You can't afford to, if you, if you put your foot in a fire, you can't afford to think, oh, I've got to take that out. That's what the C fibers do. The A fibers, it's a reflex arc, goes right up to the spine, back down again, wham, gone and it saves skin and life so that's why we have two unfortunately um, the C fibers go on producing pain sensation for a long time <laughs> but then you know it's a protective mechanism because um, pain uh, if your pain is an indication there's something wrong and the best way to fix something is stop using it in the short term and that's what pain does it also attracts prostaglandins and all sorts of complicated things, but we won't worry about that. Okay, and this is the mapping. So, this is a uh, somatosensory map. So look at this. This is uh, how, it's, how, how the brain appreciates this. Okay, this is in the, the primary somatosensory cortex, cortex here. So you see the foot, but, and that. look at the expanse of the sensation from the hand and the face and mouth. See that? So, and this here, because we're coming on to this in a minute, this is all there is for somatic pain. Sorry, not somatic, visceral pain. See? Intra-abdominal organs. That's it there. And this is all sensory pain. Um, so, uh, we don't need to go anymore. That's too complicated. Okay, so what's this? 
Any idea? Come, this is easy. Yes, chicken pox. Sorry? So, um, in, our, in our generation, because we're all getting old now, we used to have chicken pox parties. Remember? Kids used to get together. Somebody had chicken pox in the street. Let's have a party. Do you know why they did that? Sorry? Yeah. But the resistance following an infection lasts a lifetime. Well, it used to, but we, we're, we're dying later than 70 now. So after 70, you tend to get uh, this, which is shingles. So this is, this is C6, and here, from the neck, and this is C4. So this is, this is the shingles vi uh, vi virion virus, which has been sitting there for whoever knows how long, 50 years or something. And then when your defenses become less stringent, the body can't defend itself again. And if you get sick, then this is what happens. And shingles is actually a very bad and painful illness. It can be, especially if it's in the eye. First thing you should do is, uh, is the first thing you should do if you get this is go and see your doctor and get some prednisone and an antiviral. The sooner you get the prednisone into you, the less likely you are to have post-herpetic neuralgia. That's, that's persistent pain long term. Okay, so visceral pain is uh, part of the autonomic nervous system. Okay, visceral pain is completely different. Okay, for obvious reasons. This pain is caused by the stimulation or damage to the sensory neurons, termed nociceptors inside the body. Visceral pain occurs when there is damage or disruption to internal organs and tissues. It produces non-specific pain, often described as deep, squeezing, dull, and it's not dermat dermatome specific. <coughs> uh, so if you think about appendicitis, so a child with appendicitis or an adult with appendicitis will present with pain around the navel, okay? Because the inside of the gut is starting, or the inside of the appendix is starting to get sick. And when the, so it's, 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 um, Visceral pain, but when the when the um, infection goes through the wall of the appendix, then then the pain sensation moves over to McBurney's point, and uh, and when you press there, it's extremely painful. That is somatic pain, and that's the difference between visceral pain and somatic pain, or one of the differences. Okay, uh, so doctor. <laughs> I thought you were going to give me a hard time today. <laughs> I saw this lady about six weeks ago, three months after she'd been everywhere to get this shoulder pain sorted out. Now, what happened was that uh, her shoulder was stiff and she experienced pain here. So she had a frozen shoulder, couldn't move it out. But when she tried to move it out, she got pain both sides of her arm. So how, what, what was happening there? Any idea? No. Uh, well, she had rheumatoid arthritis in the shoulder. Okay, that's what froze her shoulder. I gave her cortisone; it released it a bit, but the pain was still there. So that was the somatic pain. But the pain here, which has very little to do with that, was visceral pain. Fascinating. See, completely separate from the, from the pain source site, which is up there, the, um, the rheumatoid arthritis was damaging her joint, and yet she felt it down here. Okay. Oh, it's just visceral. Well, it's unusual. <laughs> I haven't seen a case like it. But, um, but visceral pain it's not the same as somatic pain. It doesn't have a designated pattern. It can, it can produce pain anywhere. People call it phantom pain until you f f look at it and find out there's a cause for it. But just because there's pain somewhere doesn't mean that the pain is arising from pathology at that site. Hmm. 
Okay, the autonomic nervous system. I oh, know. Autonomic nervous system uh, it is, control, is, a, is a control system that acts largely unconscious uh, in a conscious manner. Um, it has two components. One, the sympathetic nervous system uh, is the driving force behind the fight and flight response, which I'm sure you all know about, and triggers several physi physiological changes which prepare the body to confront or flee a perceived threat. The parasympathetic nervous system controls the rest and digest functions of the body. It is responsible for re regulating digestive and sexual function while keeping heart rate and blood pressure steady. So, this, this is the limbic system. Limbic, si limbic means, it's Latin for uh, lining. So, this limbic system sits there. Oh. I know I missed something. Sorry, I'll just go back. Uh, there. D uh, how many brains have we got? Three? Uh, uh, there's two sides, so that's cheating. <laughs> three, basically three. So we have a hind brain there. We have the mid brain, which joins the hind brain to the forebrain. And the forebrain is the cerebellar, cere uh, cerebral cortex which is all the new brain. It's called, this is actually the forebrain, it's called the neocortex, new brain. Uh, sorry, I didn't mention that before because it becomes relevant. Okay, so <coughs> this is basically, this lines the old brain, the, hi the hind brain where the cerebellum is and the mid brain. And this lines the top of it, sits on top of it. And the, the, the cerebral cortex here, this, the cerebral cortex, the neocortex, the new brain, sits on top of that. And uh, I've put down a list of things that these different parts do. The amygdala is here, which is, uh, which is the oldest part of the, of the limbic system, associated with emotion and memory and social um, processing. The millary bodies, that's these. Uh, that's recollective memory. Hippocampus, which is this. Uh, cognition, spatial memory, and learning. Uh, the hippocampus is important for processing short-term memory to long-term memory. Uh, cingulate gyrite, which is this. Yeah. Um, is emotion, uh, processing, learning, and memory. And thalamus, and here, this is the thalamus. And hypothalamus, and, and the nuclei there. Um, that's all associated with homeostasis and uh, physiological regulation, and it bridges the midbrain to the forebrain. And the basal ganglion, which are this, this here, and then we have these. These are the uh, olfactory bulbs. Anybody know what's special about olfactory bulbs? It's the only nerves, and this, there's, there's uh, 10 million in each of these at least. It's the only nerve that goes from outside the body directly into the brain. The only nerve that does that. Hutchins, remember H Hutchins from In Excess? Remember he, uh, well the story's different, depends what you read, but he was either hit by a taxi or somebody beat him up, probably the latter, and they, they smashed his, the, the base of his nose and he couldn't smell anymore. And he lost everything, he lost taste, because smells, pa taste, taste is smell, smells taste. And he couldn't enjoy life and, that, and they think that's one of the reasons he killed himself. Okay, there he is, there we go. This is the olfactory, olfactory bulb there, that w which I showed you, the blue one, and there's all the nerves, 10 million either side, plus. And it, that, that's the basis of aromatherapy, by the way. You know, you can, there are certain, certain herbs and things that give a smell which pacify people or makes them angry. There's all sorts of different things you can use with smells. Uh, okay, so this is this is basically the, the the blue is the parasympathetic. Oh God, here we go again. The blue is the parasympathetic, and the red is the sympathetic. 
fibers. Which one was developed phylogenetically? Which was the f which developed first, the sympathetic or the parasympathetic? Why? It's good. Why? It's correct. <laughs> fight, fight, and f fight or flight. Defense mechanism. So when we were in the water. We needed that. We didn't need a brain because we didn't have a brain at that stage. That developed later. That was developed when we came out of the water. A sophisticated brain. So that developed first, which is why it's, which is why it's all, this is the body, effectively. And this is the brain stem and brain. So the parasympathetic fibers come from here. And that was developed secondly. OK. Uh, oh. <laughs> Nobody saw that, did they? <laughs> so uh, there is um, there's substantial evidence now why we left the waters. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't resist that. Was sorry, I'm sorry. About that. Okay. So this is a case study. Okay, this is Kevin. All right, an accomplished professional and conditioned athlete. He would boast about his well-being. In 30 years of work, he had never taken a day off sick, except. It all happened in 2005. Age 50, everything changed. For the next 10 years, he was tormented by significant pain and debility. This is his story. Okay, that's a normal neck. MRI normal neck. Okay? So, he, Kevin presented with a C, C4 shoulder pain. Remember like we saw in the shingles? Okay. This is his neck. There. Yeah. So we inject this is so one, two, three, four. Look at look at this. See that? Now you can see the spinal cord here, the black bit, is being compressed. Now this is very serious. We injected his neck and uh, the pain went but this was left he wasn't the brightest spark Kevin he used to play a really good rugby player and he scored lots of tries from taking the ball out the back of the scrum and just going through the line on the try line <laughs> to the guys on the try line using his head as a battering ram that's what caused this this is amazing what we do when we're young isn't it anyway so what's what, what's, so, what's the big problem about this here any idea well, yes, yeah, noses get worse. There's, you can see the fluid from the brain as it comes down is impeded. Its, its movement is impeded. But if this goes any further across, what's going to happen? It's already paralyzed. Or C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. Yeah? Phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve comes out of C4 here. And look, look at that. There's hardly any gap there at all. This chap, that's serious. Okay, that's the starter. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is 2008, you're playing squash. And this isn't, this isn't Kevin's x-ray, he was a lot worse than this. This is only a, about a 25, a grade one spondylolisthesis. This is, spondylolisthesis is when a vertebrae moves forward on the other vertebrae there. So up to 25% is grade one, up middle is, is uh, grade two grade three and then grade four when it's separated. Um, Kevin had a grade f grade two, so this was moved across. I, I had to steal this from, from the web. Um, so, that required, that required stabilization. This is a good operation, by the way. So we had spaces put in here, everything was pulled back. Six pedicle screws, two Harrington rods, and six bone grafts. Not bad. Uh, what's next? Oh, I didn't know this, but atrial fibrillation uh, is associated with spondylolisthesis. I didn't know that. Um, and this, and Kevin needed at least 20 cardioversions. You know where they put them? Where you're in atrial fibrillation, you put them to sleep, bang, and shock them back into sinus rhythm. Well, he's kept on going out. <laughs> so, we had a pulmonary vein isolation. 
Palm Joy in isolation. Um, atrial fibrillation in old people is not necessarily caused by this. But atrial fibrillation in old people, doesn't matter how old you are, should be treated. Because when you have atrial fibrillation, you have myocardial function. Your heart just doesn't work the way it should do. And if it doesn't work the way it should, you get tired. And you can't be bothered to get out of bed. And life goes on like that. Who wants to live the last 10, 20 years of your life like that? So if you ever get into atrial fibrillation, see somebody who will give you some treatment for it. So uh, what happens? For Kevin, it went up in his groin, up the femoral, femoral vein, came, uh, it comes up here, there. Go, you puncture the atria, the, the wall between the two atria, and this is what, it, they burn this area. Now these are the pulmonary here. These are the pulmonary veins, okay? Now the reason you get, um, atri one of the reasons you get atrial fibrillation in younger people is because the cells of the pulmonary artery here, the border there, where they change into their atrial cells, the, the cells become immature. And those immature cells tend to fire off with, some, with stimulation, like a major trauma like Kevin had. Um, so uh, what you do is you go in and you burn around here. So you actually burn a figure of eight like that. This one's been burnt. And that stops the, it doesn't stop the impulses happening. It stops the impulses going into the atrium and the atrium causes the ventricle to contract. So you're stopping that e those extra impulses. Great procedure. But if you ever have this done, mark my word, there is a direct relationship between the, um, the experience of the, th of the cardiologist doing it. Um, if he hasn't done many, you won't get a good result. If he's done a lot, you'll get a really good result. Okay, so, now, this is 2009. He got off, this isn't his, this isn't his picture, by the way. Um, this, this, I got this from the net. So that's, that's, his, that's not his hip. But he had an extra hip replacement put in. So this was taken off. And th this is an extra hip replacement. Now, if anybody needs a hip replacement for pain, obviously the older you get, the more likely you're going to get it, get an ex extra hip replacement. Best in the world. Produced in Exeter, um, England. <laughs> and the attrition rate of a extra hip replacement is 1% per year. So if you have your hip replaced at 70, there's a 70% chance that by the time you reach 100, that hip will still be okay. So exit to hip replacement. All right. Uh, then, so, and then he got, uh, this is 2012, he got arthritis in his other hip, so he had that replaced. And then later that year, he required a repeat pulmonary isolation technique for recurrent atrial fibrillation, because he was a bit stressed <laughs> physically. All right, so now, um, trouble with having a hip replacement is uh, it's steel in a bone. And if you traumatize the bone, the steel doesn't move and the bone breaks. It's called a peri periprosthetic fracture. And that's what we're looking at here. Peri this isn't Kevin. This is a periprosthetic fracture, um, which is... Um, extremely painful because it's all somatic pain you know especially in a you know there's there's no pain receptors in the in the joint anymore because that's metal it's all in um, in the joint outside the joint surface okay so Kevin woke up the next morning after his Hip was fixed. So what they did is they had seven s seven slivers of bone, which were which were put together, cable tied. But <laughs> when he woke up, he said things aren't right here because he was lying in bed and his the broken leg was actually almost on the bed next door, because the surgeon had done this. He missed it, okay. So he missed the bottom part, okay. So. Guess what happened? He went back to he went back to surgery. Okay, but well, during the surgery that evening, 
when they were pulling the prosthesis out, when they were pulling this out, it tore the fundus artery in the leg and he bled out. So, now this is, one unit of blood is 525 mil. Body contains about eight units of blood. Um, Kevin lost five units of blood, that's 2,625 mil. That's over half his blood volume, gone. Now they put, <laughs> they put up a drip of, of uh, matched blood for Kevin. Because obviously when you have an operation like this, you always match blood. It wasn't his blood. You should have an autologous, uh, autologous conf perfusion. Should, they should have taken blood off him first before they operated on him. Anyway, um, they, the first bag they put up, he reacted to. So he couldn't, he couldn't get any more blood volume. So they had to put fillers in, just like fluid. Protein and fluid. Uh, he was seriously ill. Um, he woke up the next morning in intensive care, tubed out, he was intubated, drips everywhere and things. Okay, so, <laughs> hey, it's fixed. Or is it? Okay, this is, this is they went back into theatre and did this. Okay. Uh, what's the next one? Okay, oh, the time he fell over, he was, he was running, he had his dog, he fell over, he smashed his hip, and he also dislocate, fractured fractious dislocation of his shoulder. His acromion was broken off. Oh. His, ac his acromion there broke off, snapped off. So when he was on the floor, his shoulder here was here, and his leg was across like this, with a fracture there, <laughs> awful. And it was in the dark as well. And he and he did what any good man would do. He screamed and <laughs> screamed. Three ambulances turned up to see him. Anyway, so that was that was that. That's fixed. And then, guess what happened? The prosthesis failed. This prosthesis failed. Why? Because, well, I think there was. Because they didn't, when they couldn't clean the blood out of the leg, and blood clotted blood is, uh, you know, forms an impasse. It's difficult to heal across it. So this, each morning, this is after about three months, he um, he'd get up in the morning, and his hip had moved. So it had moved here. So the art, the prosthesis, was was proud of the bone. So he'd have to get up in the morning and do this. This is somatic pain. Okay, do this, and he was able to walk. But over time, the, pro the, ed the end of the prosthesis here started ulcerating through the leg because it was moving. So you can see these are, these are thermal scans, and you can see here it's actually going through the cortex of the leg. See that? Now that was, so, that was visceral pain, and he would sit there like, like this, just rocking. He was on morphine by then, by the way. Terrible, awful pain. Okay, so, and this is the final one. So, eczema, Christmas 2014, final replacement, left leg, there it is. And that's what he's left with now. And that's properly fixed. And that's an extra hip replacement as well. Okay. Yeah, of course you can. The c Inside. Yeah. So the so what they do is they it's like a it's like a jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> they put they put the bones back in. There were seven seven broken f f filaments of bone, and then they wrap cable ties. This is uh, titanium cable ties around, and they tighten them up. Carpentry, <laughs> carpentry 101. But it's it's brilliant. Um, okay. So here we go. So in this. So this is just a pricey of what went on. 2005, cervical spondylosis. Uh, 2008, spondylosis thesis. 2008, atrial fibrillation. 2009, severe arthritis of the hip with replacement. 2009, he got developed hypertension. 2005, pulmonary vein isolation. Severe arthritis in the left hip in 2012. 
repeat pulmonary vein isolation, 2012. 2030, colonoscopy, there was precancerous polyps removed from the colon. 2014, periprosthetic fracture, which we described, and the dislocation of his shoulder. Okay, you got a picture? Australia, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you get treatment like this. I mean, not the treatment that missed the uh, lower part of the limb <laughs> um, in, in the bigger hospitals in, in, in Bangkok, but you wouldn't get, in the peripheral hospitals, you wouldn't get care like this. Uh, okay, so I've got a picture of this chap. Any idea? What, do you think he's still on drugs? Yep. Morphine. Hands up if you think he's on drugs. No? One, two, three. No? Yeah, four, five. Sorry? What year, what? Still on morphine and things. What it, now I'm talking about. It's okay. Do you think he can walk? Yeah? Do you think he can uh, run? Not advised. Can't blow me, especially with a neck like that. The neck hasn't, uh, yeah. the neck's a big problem in itself, as you know. So, um, uh, so Kevin is the pseudonym for him. This is the chap, this is the actual patient. Handsome chap, isn't he? <laughs> this is all me. I went through all this. One of the reasons I retired early. <laughs> um, okay, any questions? Anybody want to ask me any questions? Nothing? Yeah. Is this from the NHS? No, nothing. Uh, um, Mobilisation, weight loss, exercise. Keep moving. If you ever get like this, start moving as soon as you can. I, I am in pain. I get in pain. I'm, my back's sore now. But I don't suffer. I don't suffer pain. If I've got a problem, I'll sit down, which is what this chair's for. Or I'll lie down. Five minutes, it's gone. Don't need pain relief. The body is designed to protect itself against injury like this. And it does it in a really magnificent manner. But if you just go to bed and lie there for six months, then everything will stiffen up. And you won't, you won't be able to get out of bed. And you won't be able to walk around like this. Um, th first of all, thank you for your talk. But secondly, I'm really glad to hear you say that. Because in another lifetime, I used to work for Grunenthal. And we used to have a drug called Tepentadol. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I know a little bit about chronic pain from a research point of view. But to hear you go through that and tell that story, that's yeah. amazing. Thank you. Yeah, but it's uh, but it's real, and you shouldn't. And and um, the 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 problem with pain is the limbic system. People get trapped in their emotions and things, and it goes round and round and round. And if you're frightened of pain, you will end up with more pain. The worst thing you can do is be frightened. You have to take a positive attitude, be realistic, get off the painkillers, and get a life. Anything else? Yeah. Thank you. Ah, uh, interesting talk. I'm a retired uh, surgeon, and I just want to endorse your comment about the pain. Uh, it's critically important that people know that pain pills are good for about three days. It's one of the reasons why it is b you notice if you go to your friendly doctor now, they don't give you a whole lot, because reality is what happens is within a very short time, you, the amount of pain pills that you need is more, and it becomes more. and it and especially with the medication that's available today, addiction is very, can very simply happen in a very unlikely person to be addicted. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, great talk. And uh, I thank you for uh, persevering <laughs> with uh, your, some your same surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, you. pain is um, pain management and morphine and, uh, you know, addictive drugs like that. There's two aspects to it. One is that, um, that you know, your body gets tolerant of them and, it, and the liver mops it up quicker, so you need a bigger dose. But the second thing is you become addicted to it, so you need a bigger dose. So you need, it's a double whammy. 
you know, you, every time you double it, you quadruple it, if you think about it, because there's those two problems. Yeah, very quick. Um, I, I still suffer from an accident this 45 years ago, and the neurologist uh, told me to take the ophenadrine uh, medicine. Ophenadrine? Yes. What do you think about to take? Does it work? Have you got, have you got, have you got bladder problems or anything? You got bladder? Okay. Well, if it works, use it. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. So can I well, take it? It's, it's good. Well, do you use it all the time? I mean, you best no, not. No, only only on demand. Only. Oh, that's okay. If you're using it on demand, that's fine. But the, uh, you know, um, wh where's is it? Your low back or your neck? What's sore? Or hips? Oh. Where? It's coming on the whole left side because I had a very hard accident uh, 45 years ago, and I suffer from the accident, and I have some muscle uh, yeah, imbalance. On, on yeah. No, that that will work for that. That's okay. Uh, the other thing you should do is be proactive, and you should work. You should go to the gym and if you can, or get yeah. some weights and, and work out. And try and uh, yeah, but you need to you need to uh, preferentially focus on your left side because that's where the pain is. And you might find that with that exercise and building up your muscles, if you can, that you actually get better. Well, I cannot build up muscles if I try to do that. To do too much exercise, then it gets more worse. It gets so more. Oh well, there you go. Well, there's your answer then. <laughs> if you've tried that, then uh, then you have to resort to pain, to pain meds or or something to alleviate the pain. I did a really physical job for a long time, and uh, I kind of, because I had to do it every day, and, and no matter how I felt, it, I kind of learned to work through pain. And now it's kind of like, I, I kind of wonder whether I hurt myself or, or, or not by doing that. Um, I mean, I still have, you know, leftover pain from various things, especially my shoulder. But the, um, is there a way to, to balance when to work through minor pain and when not to? Um, oh, good question. And when, when, was, when were you overworking? And what were you doing? Were you a builder or something? Was it? Uh, I was a carpet installer. Carpet um, source, you bent forward. Well, okay. I bent forward, so I have neck problems, yeah. I have shoulder problems, yeah. and knee problems. Um, but y but your spine's actually okay, is it, when they do yeah, an x-ray? Yeah, for the most part. That part's yeah. fine. <laughs> so but um, I did it for about 30 years. Yeah, so it's all about mobilization and uh, manipulation things. Get the, get the activity back in your spine. You see these little old ladies, you know, ties, female ties, right, eastern... Um, and calcium deficient and when they get in the fields they're bending like this cutting rice all day you see them by the time they're 60 gone through the menopause they can't straighten up again now that's wedge fracturing of the, s of the lumbar spine you can, nothing you can do about that and you see these poor old ladies they come and ask me for vitamin injections and all sorts of things which doesn't make any difference uh, but uh, you know work, you can preferentially work your shoulders and neck and back out and if you've got problems, come and see me, because, you know, that's what I do, pain management. Uh, just as, as an aside on pain management, what's your opinion on the use of marijuana in pain management? Uh, um, CBD or THC? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is, I mean, this is Thailand, this is best, isn't it? So, so Thailand government introduces uh, cannabis and making it legal. And, it, and it's trying to produce CBD oil, okay? So it puts people out to grow the plants. It takes it, harvests all the stuff, <laughs> and then they make the CBD oil out of it. <laughs> the first batch they had was 85% THC <laughs> and 15% CBD. Brilliant, only in Thailand. Uh, the answer to your question. Um, uh, C CBD. I mean, it's used. It's used for two things, and, and it's and it's allowed to be used for two things in this country. One is insomnia, and the second one is chronic pain. Um, but it depends on your pain, and and how much of it is what we call supratentorial. Supratentorial is the limbic system. 
You know, when somebody says, oh, it's, super, it's all in their head. Yeah, it's in the limbic system. So you, to regulate the limb, limbic system, a bit of THC is not too bad. But uh, like all these things, you know, you get used to it and you get addicted to it. If you're going to use it, don't use it all the time. But yes, it, you know, try anything. But don't, don't get overwhelmed by it and, and realize that it's up to you to get well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I'm, I'm using it in a patient of mine, 84 years old, down in um, John TM. And um, he's, he's infarcted most of inside of his brain, so CT scan's not much there. But he gets, he gets vertigo, and then that reflects into his brain, and he gets pain. So I tried CBD for that for him. I, I didn't try it. I gave it to him for trying for his. Um, and it didn't really work, but I added THC, and he's better. He's not as agitated as it was. And, and it's legal. I, a doctor has to authorise it like I did with his patient. Um, and then, you can, then it's allowed, the government will sanctify the release of the product. Yes? Yes. I'd uh, like to add to that. Um, one of the very bad things going on in the US is people don't know what they're getting anymore. No. And... Um, Two, two problems with the uh, marijuana to begin with is the marijuana that's available is so potent that the rapid uh, road to all the problems, uh, which I see is twofold. One is marijuana should never, ever be encouraged for use in somebody under 25 because it stunts the uh, growth of the neural system. Uh, number two, um, it's now frequently, of all the stuff that's out there in the U.S., is mixed with fentanyl. So you're yeah. literally yeah. dealing yeah. with uh, something that uh, is potentially very bad. The third thing is that this whole um, stuff about it being harmless is really completely untrue. It's, it's particularly in the higher concentrations and what they're finding now which they've actually known for decades, is that with the, these very potent forms of THC, uh, that uh, profound psychosis and yeah. all the other crap yeah. that goes with but it, the crime, you name it, yeah. uh, frequently happens in the 40s in people that have been chronic users yeah. uh, in the okay. past. So I think the bottom line is, um, Please find an alternative yeah. to the, uh, so uh, marijuana is your choice the because the in the long run you're going to come unstuck. The, the argument about that is um, whether the, um, the THCs cause the psychosis or whether there's a pre-psychotic illness in the patient in any case. Not sure. But certainly if you've got a pre-psychotic problem, schizophrenia, if you smoke dope, you lose reality. And what does, what does schizophrenia cause? Loss of reality. So it's a double whammy. And, th and sometimes they don't return from it, which is what you're saying. The other thing that you're talking about was um, uh, use in, in young people. The, the Canadians did a study on this because they used to smoke marijuana at school, the kids. And um, it's no more carcinogenic than normal tobacco. That came out of the result. That's, that's a good result right there. Um, but the, uh, what you're saying about people under 25, because in a, in a male in particular, the brain isn't fully formed by them. It's not fully formed until 25. And giving kids, it's totally inappropriate. It's like what we're seeing now with these mobile phones. These kids are addicted to it. And, and, and you, you can see there's this films on Facebook and things of, of kids. They take their phone off and they just start screaming. And then when they go to sleep, their thumbs are doing this on a phantom phone. And the, the problem with this is that uh, and the psychi psychologists and psychiatrists are into this. The, w the problem is that we worry about whether these children, as they get older, will be able to differentiate between the reality of their phone and external reality. Because we're already seeing in kids, they have difficulty changing from one to another. Hmm. So yes, you're right. Thank you for that comment. Anything else? <laughs> yes?
actually it's a little more buyer beware uh, for marijuana here than it is in the states. Um, the yeah. state, you go to the the shops there, everything is regulated, everything is measured out. Uh, you know exactly how much THC and how much yeah. CBD oil you're getting in each uh, edible or whatever you're you're getting. And as far as the fentanyl comment, that's just simply not true. Oh, is it? Oh, oh. is that right? Because I, I, I read that somewhere as well. So, no, not from a clinic. Yeah, but this this is no, this is illegal supplies. They cut with they cut with anything and everything. Um, so I I, I apologise. I didn't realize. But a, a clinic, a, a good clinic. Well, my fear about the whole thing of introduction of cannabis into Thailand or re-legalizing it uh, was that, you know, these people can't drive in any case. And if they drink and then they're stoned. I mean, I don't know. Is the, has the accident rate gone up over the past couple of years? Probably. We'll have to look at that. I'll have to look at that. I'd like to know. No, no, we never, never. <laughs> um, okay, anything else? Any other questions? Yes, sorry, my, come over here. Yes. Yeah, my question is, uh, is really about exercise for pain. I've, uh, I've been lucky so far, not had much pain, never all try to avoid painkillers unless I've had a really good night yeah, out. I'd. On the Newcastle Brown? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not that far north. <laughs> well, but close enough. I've, I've developed pain in one shoulder. Yeah. Doctor diagnosed it as tendonitis. Yeah. And I had some uh, therapy and <coughs> massage and it improved it and then I've developed it on both shoulders. But what I used to do is that five to ten kilogram weight, I used to pull it up like that. Mm. I can go to the airport and I can pick two suitcases up like that, no problem. But if I want to push any up like yeah. Mm. So my but when I do this exercise, I do it for a week or two, I don't know whether I'm making things worse or better. Well you should Because at my age I'm not gonna build much muscle up, am I? Well, you, you're building the supraspinatus tendon. You're trying to strengthen the supraspinatus tendon. The supraspinatus tendon yeah. comes through here. And the muscle is back here. Now, the muscle doesn't do much except this. Yeah. The other muscles lifting back yeah. here. Well, triceps. You're, triceps. You're developing the arms instead of the shoulder. Well, uh, it's difficult to develop the shoulder. Yeah. But um, when so you get... So what's the best thing for me then? Well, <laughs> any idea? <laughs> do you have <laughs> live with it? <laughs> can I ask you a question? Personal question: Do you have uh, uric high uric acid? Not really, no. no. Not, you not had that it I tested? Well, I had X-ray and it did show a bit of white buildup. Yeah, well, you'd get that in any case, especially yeah. with, with with recurrent or chronic um, supraspinatus tendonitis. You'd get that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's just that if you get uric acid de deposits in there, the uric acid crystals, it's like the gout. Well, it's gout. Said, yeah. The physio said when he put hot, treat, hot, uh, hot lamp on it and massaged it, he said he's try he he'll break that up. Is that, is that true? No, not really. No? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they say okay that. <laughs> they say that. But it, you, you can break inflammation, but you can't break calcified inflammation. Different. Uh, you can take away calcified inflammation, cortisone injections and things. I'd just like to add to the uh, doping and driving uh, discussion. Uh, it's well held, I believe, that marijuana mixed with alcohol potentiate each other. So if you have any urge to do that, please don't for your <laughs> own sake. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in terms of the gentleman's comment, I think, um, yeah, there is... Um, and it's, an, it's, a, it's like here, I, I haven't been here for three, four years, and it's been an explosion where you've got mm. three marijuana shops next to oh, each I know. other. I know. Same thing in the US. Mm. But the real problem is those, and the cannabis oil which you've uh, the described, to totally a legitimate comment. The problem is that the illicit production of marijuana has hugely increased and that's where your problem with the uh, mixing comes in. And uh, 
the, the bottom line is it's 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 so cheap and so available, which is one of the reasons why we've both stressed never in children for the already mentioned. Thank you. And I'll be Doctor. Quiet. Thanks very much for that wonderful talk, Martin. I right, have no idea that you'd been through such a horrible time with all those different types Don't of pain. Don't talk about it. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, it makes you think of a couple of things. The first one is uh, having been to uh, talk about chronic pain from an orthopaedic surgeon one time, and he said to us doctors, he said, everybody's pain journey is unique, and what you have to tell each patient is that their pain won't be caused by exactly the same thing as the guy that they go and have a coffee with or a beer with. And so, what? A, and, and if you go to a marijuana shop, they'll say, yeah, marijuana helps. Or if you go to a physio, they'll say, physio helps. But um, th the thing is that just because it helps your buddy doesn't mean it's going to help you. And we have to kind of have the capacity to look at ourselves in the mirror, don't we, and say, is this really helping me? So when there's nobody around, we're not trying to please anybody or there's no one else. Is this helping me? Because if all you've got to hammer, everything looks like a nail. So the, for the physio, they'll say, yes, this is, physio is helping you. But you, you have to go home and, and look. And, I, and only try it for a couple of times and just keep going on your journey. But the, so that's, a, that's one thing that I was just thinking about, the journey. And it's, everybody's journey is unique because the pain, what exactly is causing the pain? As you say, it's all those different things. It's visceral, somatic, and yeah. autonomic, and all those different things, and psychological and spiritual. And But the, but the other thing is That's that why it's such an interesting discipline. Oh, 40 is, years is, I've been doing this. Is, Brilliant. It is, and it's, it's so um, mysterious. And uh, anyway, the, the other thing I was thinking about was... Uh, um, Alzheimer's. No, Alzheimer's. It's marijuana addiction. <laughs> no, that's a, that'll do. That's, that's that's it. Okay, well, there can I no, just... The, no, the other, one, the other one I was, wanted to say was about... Uh, so not everybody... Unfortunately, we're not all blessed with the same resources and, and, and ability to kind of take that journey ourselves. So some of us have the capacity to kind of have a positive attitude and, and go through stuff. But for other people, it's much harder. And or some people just do not have the resources and they've never had the sort of ability or the training to kind of do that exploration. Because it often, that exploring what's responsible for pain is just so many facets and dimensions to it. And it's, it's the know thyself thing. And some people are never going to be able to go through that, unfortunately. And we just have to do the best we can and, yeah, and minimise harm with, with poor people like that who don't have the, res the capacity to, to kind of face all those challenges like you did. So some people just are never going to get like, as you say, some people who'd had all of that would be in a wheelchair now yeah. or be in an aged home or something because they just didn't have the ability uh, with their they cognitive They would try to put me in but I, that's why I flew to Thailand. <laughs> Joking. To, to, do, to do that. <laughs> the, but but short answer to that is um, if you have good operations and good procedures you can overcome this you can overcome anything and and it doesn't relate necessarily to money find love find somebody who loves you and cares for you and your life will change so can I can I just say one thing this chap wants to talk but can I just say one thing um, uh, it relates to what you were saying as well so um, the day my father died um, when I'd, uh, I didn't know oh, I missed this bit out. Oh, when my father died, I, uh, I cried. Joy, because he was no longer suffering, it was brilliant. And I looked at him and I said, he was dead then. I said, Dad, when I'm qualified, nobody will suffer the way you suffered. That's a pledge I made. Now, I went downstairs to my brothers who had been sitting up most of the night. And I told them that he was deceased. So we, we, three of us got together, crying and things. They were really distressed. My elder brother was angry. He'd come back from Cambridge and he was furious because he was blaming the doctor for missing the diagnosis. But so be it, Dad's dead. And, you know, he was very fond of his dad. I was elated because I'd seen for the first time in my life somebody dying and realising there's nothing to be frightened about. And the third thing was that my younger brother... Um, he was, he was youngish and immature, so he just was lost, 
Now there's three people with the same experience, with similar genetics, with totally different responses to the, to the situation. And that is what pain management's all about. There isn't one that suits all. You have to look at the individual, sort out what's wrong with them, and work through it. Hmm. I have a question about uh, your life cycle. My life cycle? <laughs> <laughs> um, neglecting pain during top sports like rugby, is there a relation with the problems later in life? The neck, definitely. The, uh, the hips, because I haven't got arthritis. <laughs> I haven't got arthritis. I'm glad you asked this, because this is really interesting. Um, I had knock knees when I was a kid. And when I was, a, I was a page boy at my uncle's wedding, probably about three years old. And uh, you can see on the photographs, family photographs. So what, the f what my mother did was take me to the doctor, and I wore a splint in bed for three years. Fell out of bed, broke my arm, and all sorts of things. But, so what, what happens is it was pulling the legs together. But when it was pulling the legs together, I think, it was pushing the hip out. What happens when you push stress the hip? Arthritis. And I think that's what caused my arthritis. And I got to medical school and I looked at this. And I said, what do we do about knock knees? Oh, we don't do anything. They straighten naturally. Um, <laughs> so about uh, eight years ago, I had a motorcycle accident in mm. Thailand and cracked uh, five or six ribs all on the left hand side. Um, my question is, I've always had pain on my left hand side for my maybe 20, 25 years. After I cracked my ribs, the pain disappeared for about six months or a year. The pain's back again now, and it depends on which way I lie in bed as to whether I have the pain on a night or not. Sorry? Um, how, how, does that, how did that happen? Where the pain stopped for, say, six months and then came back again? Well, when you, when you break a rib, you get something associated with a broken rib. It's something called an axonotomesis. The nerve becomes bruised. And that takes a long time to settle. And if it's cut, you know, if it's snapped, for example, it takes, I mean, it grows really slowly. What is it, one centimeter a month or something? It takes years to grow back. So you had... Uh, uh, an avulsion of the nerve, presumably, or a bruising in the nerve, and the nerve wasn't functioning, but it is now. So that's nature. What was the pain inside your chest? I don't understand that. Oh, I can't give therapy. I can't give clinic. <laughs> it isn't, it isn't, sorry. You can talk to me afterwards if you like, and I'll talk about your pain inside your chest, because that shouldn't have happened. 25 years ago, it shouldn't have happened. Because you had your accident eight years ago? Yeah. Anything else? Yes, sir. Raj. <laughs> wait, wait, I'll get it. Yeah. Hang on. Hang on. Came out, came out, came out. There you go. Yeah. Oh. You know, after a certain age, we all have some kind of pain or the other. And I found that modern uh, painkillers are uh, pretty effective and very relaxing. Is it a moderate use of painkillers justifiable yes. or acceptable? Yeah, but not all the time. Yeah, and, the and then the other thing, <laughs> who was it who said to me when I came, when I came in? Who was it? He said, uh, oh, what's she talk about? I said, pain management. Oh, we're talking about divorce, are we? <laughs> who, who was that? Who said that? <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I had a bad fall about eight years ago. I fell onto concrete from about two or three meters up and did <laughs> immeasurable damage to my shoulder. And I put up with it for about seven or eight years on paracetamol and drinking coffee and up at night. In the end, then, I just couldn't take it anymore. And uh, I went and had uh, a prosthetic put in. And it took about three months of exercising in the swimming pool two or three times a day to build the muscles up once I'd had it. But now, it's incredible. It's just gone completely. All the pain is gone. See, appropriate management mitigates risk of pain long term. Um, it seems like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, 
but the body kind of chooses which pain to, to uh, like if you have a headache and, and you stub your toe, all of a sudden your headache is gone and your toe is what hurts. Does the body seem to choose which pain is more important? What, what do you mean by stubbing your toe? In England, do you know what that means? Okay. <laughs> having se- means having sex. <laughs> so I don't know why your headache went. <laughs> um, uh, answer your question. Uh, it's all. It's all. Per- it, this is how big the subject is. It's all personally specific. You can't say one formulation fits everybody. Everybody in this room has a different reaction to pain. Everybody. Mm. Anything else? Dr. Green, you have been amazing again today, and we want to thank you. You know, anytime there's a lot of questions, that means people are in a lot of pain. So uh, on behalf of the PCEC, I'd like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. Try to, try to smile when you're not in pain. Okay.